Hi guys, James at Rampant Line Reviews again for you today with another beer review. For this one, we have a little bit of a special review. This one is going to be number 2300. Very recently, of course, as well, we've hit 8,000 subscribers, which is just craziness in my opinion, but you know, it's, it's really pretty cool as well at the same time. And we're also very close to the seventh anniversary of the channel. I uploaded and published my first video on the 31st of July 2013 back in Aberdeen, and the last seven years have just been an awesome 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 journey and of course you know that is down to you guys the subscribers and of course my fellow beer tubers um, you know some of you have sent me beers some of you have met up with me and showed me around your hometowns and things like that and you know even the comments you guys have taught me so much about different styles of beer you've recommended a hell of a lot of different beers to me and you know the whole channel started as a way for me to document the different beers that I was trying so to me it's really a way of kind of documenting my palate growth if you like so it's been a really fun journey over the last seven years so to all of you who have contributed to the channel over the last seven years from the bottom of my heart a huge huge thank you big shout out to my fellow beer tubers of course it's great to be part of that community. There's some awesome guys out there and uh, I would recommend that you go and check some of those guys out as well, actually. So, um, yeah, I hope that you guys continue to enjoy the reviews for uh, for however long this lasts. I've got no intentions of stopping this, of course. It is a bit of fun. It's a nice hobby to have. And, uh, yeah, I get to learn a hell of a lot about beer too, which is not, which is never a bad thing. But, yeah, hope you guys continue to enjoy the reviews. And for this one, we have a beer that I think will be very, very quirky and interesting. And it's from two very famous breweries that I've just never reviewed on the channel before, actually. And it's strange that, considering this is 2,300 videos and seven years into the channel. So, for this one, then, we are going to have a look at a beer that is half Belgian, half Irish. And so this one is a collaboration between Brauerei Timmermans from Eterbeck, just outside of uh, Brussels on the Belgian side, and Guinness Brewery from Dublin and Ireland on the Irish side. The beer itself is called Lambic and Stout. It comes in at 6% ABV and it is a blend of the Timmermans uh, Old Creek, which is their Cherry Lambic, and the classic Guinness Stout. So um, yeah, very very curious to see how this one turns out. I think this is the third iteration of this beer. I believe it was first released back in 2018, but I do know there is definitely a 2019 one. I'm not. Sh I can't remember if there is a 2018 one or not. But the beer itself is uh, bottled, from what I understand, at the uh, the. Timmermans Brewery just outside of Brussels like I said so the I guess Brauer Timmermans are the home brewery in this case but very very curious to see how this one turns out I've heard that it's a very interesting beer we got this one here in Sweden as part of the Teferi sortiment on one of the releases in July 2020 so um, yeah I hope that you guys enjoy my take on this one so as always with my reviews I'll tell you a little bit about both breweries before we taste the beer if you want to get straight to the tasting just fast forward all the usual links are in the description below that's the brewery website the link to my future reviews that I'll do from Brauerei Timmermans and from the Guinness Brewery as I said very first time I'm trying something or reviewing something I should say from either of these breweries but you will see more reviews in the future I do want to do some dedicated reviews to these breweries but there's all the usual social media down there as well if you want to see more reviews do please consider subscribing to the channel the whole channel of course has a geography based tagging system so you can go into the home page and search for beer based on country, city, state, county, province, prefecture, whatever it is you're interested in. Do check out the playlists of beers from different countries. There is one there for the Irish beers that I've reviewed for you and another one for the Belgian beers. Both of those are being added to whenever I get the opportunity and you will find this beer in both of those lists because it is dual nationality. And as always, please do get in touch and let me know some of the other beers and breweries that you guys would like to see me review. It's always great to hear from you guys that are watching the videos and the support that you show the channel is hugely hugely appreciated. So anyway, to tell you a little bit about Brauerite Timmermans first off then, since these guys, as I say, are the home brewery as such. So Brauerite Timmermans, as I mentioned to you already, are based in Etebeek, um, just outside of Brussels, in Flemish Brabant and they can trace their history back to the year 1814. So there's a note this year from the municipal treasurer that a brewery by the name De Mol was being run by Jacobus Vaurevins. 
So this brewery was a very small one and it only produced 15 hectolitre batches three or four times per year, but it was intended to serve a relay station where there was, and you know, this thing was where there was horses that were changed and the riders could stop, have a meal, drink a beer while the horses were being, you know, reshoed and watered and all of these kind of things. So basically, a, almost like the, the, the equivalent of a, a service station these days, to be honest. But yeah, quite cool that they had a brewery. Um, but the farm of this relay belonged to Peter Verheilewegen, and then his son Hendrik also ran a small distillery for a while as well. But then later, in 1781, he started a brewery on his parents' farm. So this brewery was then leased to Jacobus Valrovins in 1814. And then this was taken over by his son Charles and then in turn by his sons Jean and Paul Joseph, who ran the brewery well into the 19th century. By 1834, though, the brewery production had grown to 700 hectolitres of Lambic beer. Um, at this time, the farm in Etebeck, which was called Het Molike, belonged to the widow Anna Katerina Verheilewegen, and then this property was later inherited by Guilhermes de Donker and Maria Theresa Lindemann. You might recognise those names if you know your Belgian beers. And then it in turn passed on to Anna Katerina de Donker and Eugenius Gustavius van der Putte. So, according to records from 1897, the next owners were Paulus Valravens and Albe uh, Albertina de Schmidt. So the brewery then passed on to their daughter Selina and their son-in-law Gerardus Franciscus Timmermans in 1911, who already owned a brewery in, in uh, St. Peter's Louvre, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But after they took over the brewery, they discontinued the farm and the orchard and they just focused on brewing the beer. And so they closed the relay a bit later in 1920. But the brewery produced Lambic, Faro and Mertz from 1866. And at this point, they had to buy their own fruit for the first time to put in these Lambic beers. So a little bit of a kind of change around for the business. But Frank Timmerman also went on to become the mayor of Etobeek, and he held this position for many, many years. And after his death, his son-in-law, Paul Van Custom, to uh, change the name of the brewery from De Mol Brewery to Timmerman's Brewery, which it remains today. And then his sons, Raoul and Jacques, took over the brewery from 1969. Apparently, though, the brewery was owned by Rizla, as in, you know, the, the, the cigarette paper company from 1984, and then it was taken over in turn by the John Martin Company from Genval uh, in 1993. Although, apparently, the buildings that the brewery was operating in are still owned by the Timmermans family, and today, this brewery are brewing around 23,000 hectolitres of beer per year as part of the John Martin company. So um, yeah, that is as kind of concise a history of the Timmermans Brewery that I can give you. Um, as I say, I think these guys are the biggest by volume Lambic Brewery, if I remember correctly. I'm not certain about that, but I think they are the biggest by volume Lambic Brewery. And of course, um, they're probably one of the most accessible ones for those of us who are living outside of, uh, outside of Belgium as well. If you go to pretty much any good beer shop in Scotland, you can get you know, the uh, one of the Timmermans uh, beers, actually. So, um, yeah, really interesting company, as I say, and another one of the Lambic breweries kind of ticked off my list, if you like. So, always cool to introduce you guys to some of these very, very classic uh, Belgian sour beer breweries, if you like. So, um, yeah, that's all I can tell you about Brauerei Timmermans for the moment. If you want to learn more, of course, you can check out the brewery website. You can follow them on Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date with all the latest goings on. And you can check out the Rate Beer Untapped and Beer Advocate pages to learn more about all of the different beers that they've done. But yeah, let's go on to the Irish side of things then, on to my notes on the Guinness Brewery. So the Guinness Brewery, as some of you might know, are based at the St James's Gate Brewery in Dublin in Ireland, and the company was founded back in 1759 by Arthur Guinness, where of course it takes its name from. So, Arthur had started brewing in Legslip in County Kildare before moving to Dublin and he leased the then unused brewery on the 31st of January 1759 for a rate of £45 for a period of 9,000 years. This lease though is no longer in effect because the brewery property was bought and then expanded uh, a few years later. But in 1769, 10 years after the foundation, the brewery exported its first beers to England and upon the death of Benjamin Guinness in 1869, the brewery was worth over £1 million and they'd grown the original site from just one acre to over 64 acres. So this was when the lease, if you like, was kind of null and void. But later in 1886, Benjamin's son Edward sold 65% of the company for £6 million on the London Stock Exchange in an open 
basically in an open uh, set, an open sale if you like. But over the next years, huge investment was made to promote the quality control, and this effort was led by the statistician and chemist William Seeley Gossett from 1899, who worked under the pseudonym Student. And you might have heard of the Student T test, which is quite well known if you do if you're into your mathematics, as I had to be when I did my chemistry and physics. Um, but the company moved its headquarters to London in 1932, and this was as a result of the Irish Free States Control of Manufactures Act of the same year. But the brewery continued to grow over the coming years, and they operated a brewery in London as well. But later in 1983, the first non-family CEO was appointed, and this was Ernest Saunders. But this time, uh, the time under him, was mired in controversy due to the Guinness share trading fraud and you know they were found to be manipulating the share prices and stuff like this and it was during this time that the company merged with a much larger distillers company from Scotland and this resulting company then later merged with Grand Metropolitan in 1997 and this group was then renamed Diageo in 2006 who are a very very well known drinks company, one of the biggest in the world but in 2005 they closed the Park Royal Brewery in London and thus all the, I, all the Guinness that was produced for the UK and Ireland was brewed thereafter at the St James's Brewery in Dublin and it remains that to this day. Apparently the brewery is still 51% owned by the Guinness family and they produce over 80 million hectolitres of beer per year. I believe that's the whole company, not just the... Um, the St James's Brewery. But on this site there is the Guinness Storehouse, which I'm sure many of you will have visited, and this documents the 250 uh, year history of the Guinness Company. I have been there, what would that have been, like 2012 or something like that, maybe 2013, and it is a very, very kind of nice place to go. I've not been in Dublin uh, since 2015, maybe actually. It's been a long while since I've been in uh, in Dublin, actually, I did cross over into the Republic of Ireland when I was in Northern Ireland visiting my friend last time, but that was only uh, very, very briefly. Actually, I do need to get back to the Republic. I'd love to do a little driving tour all the way around and visit, you know, White Hag and some of the other Irish craft breweries and things. So that is definitely something that I do. Um, that I would like to um, to, to keep in mind. But, uh, but yeah, that's all I can really tell you about Guinness Brewery for the moment. As I say, one of the world's most famous breweries and I believe one of the world's largest uh, breweries as well. So uh, yeah, I do need to see about doing a Guinness draft and a Guinness uh, export stout review for you at some point fairly soon. So keep your eyes peeled for that. I will try and get that done uh, within the next couple of weeks or months or whatever because we can get those beers fairly easily here. But um, yeah, as I say, if you want to learn more about this brewery, check out the brewery website. You can follow them on Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date with all the latest goings on. And of course, you can check out the Rate Beer Untapped and Beer Advocate pages as well. But let's get on to the actual tasting section of this video then. I'm really curious to see how this one turns out. So as I told you earlier, this one is a blend of the Guinness Original Stout and the Timmermans Old Lambic. Uh, or Old old uh, Creek, I should say, sorry, which is their Cherry Lambic. It comes in at 6% ABV, and you know it is presented more in the form of a Lambic beer than a stout. But it says on the back here, Guinness and Timmermans created an amazing blend of specialty Guinness beers with Timmermans Old Creek, the world's oldest Lambic brewery. A unique dark beer with a subtle pink hue in the foam, aromas of chocolate, oak and cherry, full flavoured and beautifully balanced. So, yeah. So this one is a 375 milliliter one, and it says on the side here... Uh, it's just telling you the ingredients and things like that. But um, yeah, best before the 30th of October 2021, apparently. So um, yeah, blend of a stout and uh, yeah, blend of a stout and a, a Creek Lambic beer. So yeah, really curious to see how, how this one turns out. There you can see, of course, the famous harp of Guinness on the top. But of course, you probably should say it's the harp of the Republic of Ireland, ancient symbol. And there you can see uh, the Timmermans symbol on the top of this one here as well. But a beautifully presented beer this one. I guess I'll probably need to keep the bottle of this and put it in as part of my uh, collection. But uh, yeah, let's get this guy out and we'll get on with the tasting then. So yeah, um, one thing about this guys, if you have tried this beer yourself, it would be very interesting to hear from you guys in the comments section below. Are there differences uh, year on year between the vintages? Obviously there will be, but did you guys notice them being uh, markedly pronounced? That would be interesting to hear. So, um, yeah, let's get this guy out and we'll get on with the tasting. A nice little bit of smoke on the opening there. And we'll get it out and into the glass. We'll just be careful with it, of course, because most Belgian beers are bottle conditioned. Although with this one being a blend, I guess it probably wouldn't be much of a problem. 
but uh, yeah, quite a few different styles of Lambic beers, of course, are blends. The Goza being the prime example, usually a young Lambic and an old Lambic, but yeah, there's lots of different, uh, lots of different uh, styles of um, these different beers, of course, lots of different styles of Lambic beer. Um, so yeah, curious to see what this one tastes like. So as you could see from this one, it's poured a lovely kind of dark, ebony, rosewoody type colour. There's a solid finger of, uh, I would say, it's actually more of a kind of, it does have a wee bit of a red hue to it, but it's actually more of a kind of, um, could you say like a fawny type colour? I think the colour of this head is a little bit more fawn-like. There's one or two big bubbles sticking towards the side of the glass, but a few little ones going up towards the bottom of the head. The head looks to be a little bit bumpy at the sides, but it does look as if it's a little bit more kind of foamy underneath but yeah really really nice looking beer if we shine the light through this one it's got a little bit of a kind of coca-cola coloured edge but overall it does look very very nice actually so um yeah curious to see what this one has in store for us so um yeah nothing particularly surprising about this beer when you consider that it is a stout you know the stout the stout colours are going to dominate whenever you put roasted malt in anything that just blackens it basically but um, yeah let's take a look at that aroma and see how we get on oh yeah it really does smell more like a, it really does smell very much like a kind of um, it, it's got more of a lambic aroma to it I think but then um, the more your nose can adjust to that once it gets past the sort of lambic quality of the sour sharpness of it, that's when you start to get more of the stout quality out of this one. Um, but yeah, I will say the aroma of this one is very, very nice. So, where to start with this? Um, the more I'm smelling this, the more stout-like it becomes. Um, it said on the back, I'm sure it, this one is a blend of three beers. So maybe it's a blend of, um, maybe they're talking about the creek being a blend of like an old lambic and a young lambic and then it's the Guinness. I would suspect that that is probably what the deal with this one is. It's the the original the creek that they've used is a blend of two beers itself, perhaps, and then the Guinness is the third one. Um, but yeah, that aroma that is very very nice. So it almost smells. It, it's kind of interesting because the majority of the nose, I think, maybe about 70, 75 percent, is the Guinness stout. But then at the front of the nose, that's when you get the kind of lambic sharper qualities out of this one. It's really interesting that. I'd be curious to know what percentage blend it actually is, but then of course if they did tell you that, a lot of people might just copy it. Um, but yeah, it would be fun to know for experimentation purposes, but anyway. Um, but yeah, the aroma of this one is very, very nice, so it gets a thumbs up from me in terms of the aroma. So straight away with this one, you're going to get that lovely kind of toasted, roasty malt quality to it. But on top of that, it does come across as being quite kind of brown, bready if you like. And it does almost have a little bit of that kind of, um, it does have a bit of a kind of chocolatey note to it at the same time. Um, a wee bit of a kind of brown sugary note in there as well, like a well kind of fired toasty caramel. But as I say, sweet kind of chocolate. Um, kind of a bit right in the middle, maybe about 50% cocoa. It's got a little bit of the milkier chocolate element to it, a little bit of the darker note. But as I say, that sits on top of a kind of sweet brown sugar, a sort of brown bready-ish type quality. And then you've got some of the roasted malt notes in there underneath but the thing that you really get out of the Guinness side of it is the smoothness I always remember um, you know I, I, I only ever drink Guinness usually in Dublin because I'm convinced that it tastes different whenever you, you drink it outside of uh, whenever you drink it outside of Ireland so yeah I would only drink Guinness in Ireland to be honest with you if it's not in the bottle I never drink I would never drink it on draft unless it's actually in Ireland but um, yeah the um, the the you, you get that very nice smoothness out of it and I do remember when I've had pints of Guinness if you get them very close to the brewery they're lovely and smooth and you get that out of this beer I've never actually tried Guinness out of a uh, out of a bottle as far as I remember I can't remember if I've had it in a can it's been you know so long since I've since I've had that beer um but you know the smoothness I do remember Guinness being just ridiculously smooth and that being the sort of trademark the beer of course the two big Irish stouts that everyone's heard of would be Guinness and Murphy's um, but yeah you get that lovely kind of smooth 
Irish stout quality, that Irish dry stout note just kind of forming at the backbone of the beer. And um, there's a few little woody undertones to it, maybe. Um, it does give you a little bit, you do get a little bit of the oaky smoothness out of it. You can pick out a wee bit of vanilla almost, which is one of the kind of subtleties you can get from the, the wood. Of course, Lambic beers tend to be aged in these oak fodder things, which will give you a little bit of a kind of vanilla quality. But yeah, the backbone of the beer for me, it's the, the roasty black malt then the smooth kind of brown bread on top of that. You've got a good bit of sweetness from the brown sugars, quite a well-fired, toasty kind of caramelly type thing. And then... There is a bit of a kind of sweet chocolatey note out of it, about a 50% cocoa thing. Woody notes coming out, maybe even a little touch of nuttiness to this one and a wee bit of vanilla. But let's focus on the more kind of lambic side of this one. So yeah, as I say, at the front of the nose, that's when you get the kind of juicy fruity notes out of it. And you get that lovely big juiciness from the cherries, but at the same time you get the impression of a few other kind of fruits in there as well. So you've got the, the sharpness, the kind of sharp, the lambic sharpness you get with this one is of course cherry, it's a creek, you know, come on. Um, but yeah, the fruity notes out of this, there are a few other things in there. It does give you the impression of a little bit of a blackcurranty, blackberry type thing. There's some juicier kind of figs in there as well, and a bit of a kind of plummy note. It's not just the cherries, but the, the sharpness, the sort of sour notes that you get out of the beer are most definitely um, are most definitely the kind of cherry notes there. The more that you focus on the lambic side of it as well at the front of the nose, the more you'll start to notice the kind of woody, oaky uh, undertones in there as well. And I suspect that the oaky qualities in this beer are sort of helping the, the breadiness, the sort of smooth brown bready, roasty black malt backbone of the beer. I'm assuming, you know, they are sort of smoothening that out a little bit, I guess. it would If this was original Guinness, it would smell I, I consider a considerable bit more roasty, I would think. Um, but yeah, on the hoppy side of things, there is a little bit of a kind of earthy note there, a very smooth earthy note, a little bit of floral note, but also a little bit of grassiness as well. But the thing is with these Lambic beers, they always add old hops into them because they don't want the, the bitterness to overpower the sour side of the brewery. So usually it's old kind of noble or Belgian hops that they put into to these beers, you know, low alpha acid hops that are just a little bit old and have lost a little bit of their potency. That's a common thing with these Lambic breweries. But yeah, the aroma of this one is really nice. Definitely more leaning towards the stout side of things, in my opinion, which is with a little bit of sour character kind of on the tip of the nose, if you like. But um, yeah, beautiful smelling beer, this one. Definitely take a little bit of time to to enjoy that you can definitely get the lambic vibe out of it but the lambic i think is a bit more subtle than the stout side of the beer but yeah let's have a taste of this one then and see how we get on so this one is called lambic and stout a six percent blend of uh, timmerman's old creek the cherry lambic and also the guinness original stout let's get stuck into this one thank you for your support over the last seven years and uh, you know many many more years to come here's to review number 2300 slanger skull proust salty cheers Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's really quirky. It really is. I love beers like this that test your palate a little bit. That's the whole reason I started the channel. When you take this in straight away, it's got that lambic um, sharpness to it. Definitely not the most puckering lambic I've come across, I have to say. Um, you know, but it, it really has. It starts off with that, but then it smooths out beautifully and really, in the aftertaste, it really becomes more kind of stout like. I don't know if maybe you can call this a black lambic actually. Um, I've had a few kind of black bodied sours if that makes sense. Temple Breakers here in Sweden were a brewery who did like a you know um, black cherry sours and things like that you know well black uh, you know black malted um, cherry sours and stuff that's what they did and um, that's probably the closest beer I've had to this one before but this one I think is very very nice and I will say the Guinness comes out quite a bit you know considerably more roasty in the uh, in the flavour than it does in the aroma definitely but yeah when you take this in first thing you're going to notice is on the front of your palate you've got that lovely um, kind of, you get a little bit of that kind of cherry sharpness coming out of the beer, but it's actually the sort of sour notes that you get with this are lovely and juicy at the same time. So I think that's really, that's really a very interesting point to make about this one. But the further you, you know, uh, you've seen how long it was since I took a sip of this beer. It's the roastiness of that malt base that's that's lingering there. You know, it's an Irish. Uh, I think you can technically term Guinness as an Irish dry stout, and certainly this beer does dry out a little bit. So um, yeah, where do we start with kind of 
summarising this flavour if you like. Um, so, middle third of your tongue and the back third of your tongue. Straight away, you can feel that lovely oaky smoothness kind of form at the backbone of the beer. If you go towards the kind of front um, of that um, that kind of middle third of your tongue, you start to get the kind of vanilla type flavours out of it. You really get that smooth kind of vanilla-ish quality in there. But you also get almost like a little island in the middle of your tongue which has a little bit of a slightly, it's almost like a slightly Werther's Original type flavour. You do get a little bit of that there, and that gives the, the, the beer a little bit of an oiliness. That's quite a common thing to find in Lambics, I think, just a little bit of that slightly Werther's Original type flavour there. But yeah, you can feel the woodiness for me in the middle of your palate, the woodiness that's there forms the linchpin of the beer. The vanilla comes out just a little bit towards the front of the middle third of your tongue, then behind that you've got that little kind of... Um, or there's original like island in the middle of your palate there. Um, on top of that though, you will notice as you progress further into the aftertaste that really dries out. But those flavours that I've just talked about, they linger there. If you go towards the back third of your palate, you really get more of the roasty black malts kind of pushing pushing the way out of the beer. The oakiness doesn't really extend that far back and and pardon me in my opinion, but you get the roasty black malts there. The brown bready notes that I was talking about in the aroma that were actually quite prominent, in my opinion, they're really not as prominent in the flavour. You do get a little bit of brown bread sitting on top of the black malty characters, but the, the, the back part of your, be of your mouth here, the final third of your tongue, really is very kind of dry actually. But I will say, the further you go into the aftertaste, it does thicken up slightly and uh, you get more of that kind of brown bready quality to it. But um, yeah, I like how that goes together in this one. And yeah, I will say that when you take the beer in, it is actually very, very smooth, but the dryness in the middle of your palate, you really can feel it kind of building actually. It almost comes across, it, the, the dryness, it's almost like you've got a kind of roll. If you go from the tip, from the, if you go about a third of the way back on your tongue, and then just go straight back in the line, it's almost like you've just got a roll of dryness there, it just goes straight back, and then it really gets very, very dry and very roasty and black malty on that, um, that back third of your tongue there, which is nice. But um, yeah, on top of the, the little island that I was talking about, that sort of um, Werther's Original type island, there is a wee bit of a chocolatey note to it. There is a bit of a kind of slightly stronger brown sugary quality to it, but those for me are quite minimal. I think the middle part of your palate, um, as I say, it's a, wood, it's a kind of oaky, woody smooth base to it. You get the vanilla notes further, a little, the slight vanilla notes a little bit further forward on the tongue, um, and those are very very subtle. It's not like a straight up vanilla as some breweries would add into their, you know, sweet stouts and things that you're getting from Omnipoil, De Morse Hotel, and things like that these days. But yeah, um, you do have a little bit of, um, there is a wee bit of very sweet brown sugar in the centre of the tongue, and then you've got the kind of Werther's originally thing underneath that. So I think that describes the the middle of the palate and the, the sort of malty woody side of things well but the, the the roasty black malts they sit on top of that you still get that smoothness there that's the really quirky thing about this beer you still get that lovely smooth backbone to the beer but the roasty notes even sit on top of those sweet things there so it's a really that flavor combination for me is really really unusual with this one but it works i do like this beer i i wouldn't hesitate to drink this again and um, i'd be curious to try it on tap and just see if the mouth feels any different because it's um it's got a bit of the, it's got the it's got a lovely smoothness to it as I say, but at the same time it does give you the typical Irish dry stout character, which is, is very interesting. But yeah. On the hoppy side of things then, back corners and palette, you've got a lovely little bit of um of earthiness there. It does get a little bit more bitter the further you go into the aftertaste. And I think that's aided by the black malty notes we were talking about. But yeah, as you move further forward along the um, the sides of the palate there, it does get a little bit, you know, the earthiness does kind of smoothen out a little bit. You get a nice little bit of a kind of floral aromaticity on the side of the palate, but then not too much actually. But then around the very front curve of the tongue, it is a wee bit lighter and grassy. You know, the comments I made about the hops earlier, the thing that you do have to consider with this is that it's a blend. It's not like a mixed rest. It's not like a, a different recipe that they've they've kind of brewed up together. It is a straight up blended beer, so you will get the hoppy bitterness um, out of the um, straight up out of the Guinness. I don't know if Guinness if they grow their own hops in Ireland for the um, for the Guinness or if they import English hops or exactly what they do with it. 
but yeah, you do get a good bit of earthiness out of this one on the back corners of the palate. So yeah, that I can see. It's interesting to see that with this beer, that the, the bitterness both from the malts and from the hops do, you know, sort of take down the um, the kind of the bitter. Uh, the sort of sour side of this beer actually which is interesting but yeah let's focus on that sour side of it now we've kind of covered most of the stouty elements of the beer but let's focus a little bit more on the the lambic side of it so yeah like I say when you take this beer in you get the you do get that sour side of it it's actually one of the more juicy sours that I've come across or juicy lambics I should say so that front third of your tongue, as soon as you take this beer in, it's very wet, very juicy. Um, it comes in, you get that lovely kind of cherry note out of it, but the front third of your palate, like I said, this is where the fruity notes come out of the beer. So towards the back of that front third of your palate, you do have the kind of cherries there with a little bit of the sharpness, but then as you move um, further forward on the palate there, you will get a little bit more of a kind of, you get a juicy kind of plummy note out of it, you get a little bit of a figgy note there, but on the very kind of front of the, the tip of the tongue, that's when you get a kind of black currant blackberry type quality out of the, um, you know, out of the beer. So I do like how all of that kind of pieces together, but yeah, the, 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 on the tip of the tongue as well, you do start to get, around the very edge of the tongue, you do get a few of the kind of, um, the kind of cherry notes kind of pushing their way out of this one but even the the roasty black malts even spread their way forward into the fruity part of the beer but on the border between the front third of your tongue and the second the, the middle third of your tongue it's almost like you've just got a well it's like a really well fired bread crusty quality like a very dry well fired bread crusty type flavor that you have sitting right between those two uh, those two different parts of the beer so i say the front third of your tongue is unmistakably lambic and it's not the most puckering sour lambic you're going to come across in my mind. It is actually more juicy and slightly oily in its characters. But then the back kind of third of your beer, it, 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 or the, the kind of back two thirds of your palate, it's definitely like a, it is more of an Irish dry stout, but with a little bit of a kind of woody uh, backbone to it. So that's probably a good way to, dis to kind of sum up this beer quite nicely actually I like how I do like how this goes together. It's a really quirky one with a good bit of complexity, which is obviously very nice for a six percenter so um, yeah take a bit of time with this beer and just sit and consider all the the flavors that you're getting but for me this is really nice let's talk about the mouthfeel then with this one so like I say when you take this one in it's got a good bit of wetness to it good little bit of a juicy character and it's just you know really very very nicely done but then as I say the further you progress into the aftertaste with this one it really dries out it really dries out a hell of a lot in the middle of your palate, but overall, I would say the liquid in this one is kind of. It's the, I would say that this is a mid-bodied beer. Um, the carbonation is quite smooth, and I just yeah, I'd say that overall it is. It is quite an oily beer. This one, rather than anything, if you consider it as a lambic, it is quite oily, but at the same time, it does have that stouty kind of smoothness to it. So it's an interesting blend, actually. Um, but yeah, in terms of the kind of bitterness out of this beer, I wouldn't be surprised if this one's actually up, you know, around the sort of 40 or 50 IBU mark. There's quite a bit of bitterness from the earthiness in this one. You've got a good little bit of bitterness from the, the malty side of things as well. The roasty black malts are giving you a good little bit of bitterness out of this in my mind. But at the same time, the malt base, it does have a bit of smoothness to it. The kind of woodier elements, the further you go into the aftertaste, they get a little bit sweeter. So it's interesting that you've got smoothness to the malt base, a little bit of a slight sweetness from the vanilla elements of the wood, and a wee bit of a brown sugary quality in there as well. So there is an interesting balance in the in the centre of your palate. Woodiness, a little bit of sweetness, and then some roasty kind of... Um, malty side, uh, roasty black malt side of things. Nice little bit of a, uh, nice little bit of a kind of hoppy, bitter character to it, if you like. Um, as I say, I think about fifty IBUs in this one, both from the malt and from the hops. Um, but yeah, the fruity side of this beer is uh, is really quite nice. More of an oily, juicy, fruity character, like I was saying. But you do have a little bit of that kind of slightly sharp. Uh, note from the lambic coming in, but I think that fades very very quickly, and this beer does start to become a little bit more like a kind of fruity, uh, a fruity stout almost. It reminds me a little bit of the raspy engine that I had from uh, Harveston Brewery uh, back home in Scotland, one of my local breweries. It reminds me of the raspy engine actually that I had from Harveston Brewery maybe 
two years ago, something like that actually. But um, yeah, a really, really quirky beer this one and definitely a nice way to mark review number 2000. 300 so um yeah i think we should leave it at that for this one this one was the lambic and stout from brara timmermans in eater bay just outside of brussels and guinness brewery from uh, the st james's gate brewery in dublin over in ireland a really really cool one this um and i've really enjoyed reviewing this one for you so as i said thank you for all your support over the last 2300 reviews you know the seven years or so but uh, yeah been awesome to review this one cool to encounter these breweries or review these breweries for you for the first time so i hope you've enjoyed it as always let me know your own thoughts on this beer in the comment section below let me know what your favorite beers are from both of these breweries you will see more dedicated reviews to these guys at some point fairly soon but uh, yeah it's been awesome to review this one for you and to introduce these breweries thank you again for all your support and i will catch you guys very soon the lambic and stout a collaboration between timmermans Bre uh, between brown and timmermans from itabate just outside of brussels in belgium and uh, the guinness brewery from dublin in ireland thanks again for watching and i'll catch you guys soon slanja school make sure you check out this beer really very very nice